Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ninth Asia Global Institute Topic Policy Webinar. I'm Hei Wai Tang, Associate Director of the Institute. The AGI Public Policy Webinar Series features leading scholars from universities and think tanks around the world to present current research on global public policy issues and discuss their implications for Asia and the world. The speaker of our webinar today is Professor Philip Lipsy, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto. He is also Chair in Japanese Politics and Global Affairs and the inaugural director of the Center for the Study of Global Japan at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. His research addresses topics such as international cooperation, international organizations, the politics of energy and climate change, international relations of East Asia, as well as the politics of financial crisis. He has also published and commented extensively on Japanese politics and foreign policy. Professor Lipsy got his PhD in political science at Harvard and was assistant professor of political science at Stanford University. The global distribution of power is shifting. Newly rising states such as Brazil, China, and India are attempting to establish themselves in positions of influence in the contemporary world order. In recent years, as international institutions grow in prevalence and influence, they have increasingly become central arenas for international contestation. The dramatic rise of Japan after the Second World War, for example, raises an important question. How was this large exogenous shift in underlying economic power accommodated across institutional contexts? Why do some institutions change flexibly while others successfully resist or fall to the wayside. Based on his recent book, Renegotiating the World Order, Institutional Change in International Relations, published by Cambridge University Press, Professor Lipsy will examine how international institutions evolve as countries seek to, need to re renegotiate the international order and how countries seek greater international influence by reforming or creating new institutional inter international organizations. In the first half an hour, Professor Lipsy will give a uh, presentation. Uh, after his presentation, there will be a 30 minutes Q&A session moderated by me. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to type questions in the Q&A box, and I will direct your questions to Professor Lipsy uh, during the Q&A session. Professor Lipsy. Take it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tang and uh, the staff of AGI for uh, graciously inviting me to the seminar today. And thank you to all of you in the audience. Um, I will share my screen. All right. So uh, today um, I will be talking uh, about uh, my book, uh, Renegotiating the World Order, uh, that was published from Cambridge University Press. Um, and uh, it's difficult to discuss a book, uh, obviously, in a 30-minute presentation. So I'll focus on the big picture background and context, my theory of institutional change, a uh, very brief overview of some of the empirical evidence from the book, and then policy implications and more recent related work on the same topic. Um, I'll skip most of the statistical analysis and formal models and, and so forth, but if that's your kind of thing, um, please feel free to look at the book. Uh, it's all in there. So the context, uh, the big question that my book seeks to answer, of course, is what happens when rising powers demand greater influence over international affairs? So we can point to Japan and Germany as rising powers in the 1930s, Japan again uh, with its economic resurgence, in the 1980s and China and India, along with a whole variety of other rising states today. The traditional answers offered by international relations theories might be grouped roughly into the following categories. So there is the realist tradition, particularly power transition theory, that tends to see conflict and war as likely outcomes when rising states challenge the status quo powers today, most prominently the United States. 
The liberal tradition, on the other hand, sees conflict as less likely, that things like economic interdependence, mutual democracy can mitigate the likelihood of conflict despite the potential tensions that come from rising powers. And finally, constructivism suggests that changing norms and ideas can make peace more likely, uh, that the world order doesn't have to always operate in the way that it has traditionally. So my contribution to this debate is to focus on renegotiation, that essentially with the rise of the post-World War II architecture of international institutions, the terms of international governance can be renegotiated peacefully without resorting to conflict. And this is an important change compared to previous international orders. Uh, two factors uh, have been important in this shift. The attractiveness of militarized conflict has declined. Nuclear weapons mean uh, mutual destruction is assured. We have economic integration, which raises the costs of war. And democracies tend to fight uh, less than other regime types. That said, despite the rising costs of military conflict, rising states still desire greater influence, recognition, and status. That hasn't changed. And so the alternative mechanism, I argue, is peaceful renegotiation. This can take the form of formal bargaining over representation, voting shares, other forms of influence. UN Security Council reform is a very uh, prominent example of this, but we can also point to reform of voting power in the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. But if that kind of bargaining is unsuccessful, countries can also create alternative institutions. Uh, these might uh, examples might include Japan with the creation of the Asian Development Bank and China more recently with the AIIB. And so the puzzle really that the book seeks to answer is under what conditions uh, is this type of renegotiation feasible and or likely? So just to look at some uh, basic data, this is the number of great power wars by decade from all the way back to 1490 to 2010. And what we see here is a broad declining trend in great power wars. Uh, the frequency of great power wars has declined. This is wars between the most powerful states in the international system. So today we might think of the United States, China, or Russia, for example. Um, but what we see towards the end here, of course, is that since roughly the 1970s or so, there haven't been direct confrontations between great powers. And this is the longest such lull, uh, at least as far as we have data available. An important reason for this, of course, is nuclear weapons. This uh, figure depicts the share of global military expenditures by nuclear armed states and their allies. Uh, it runs from zero to one, right? And you see that obviously uh, until uh, World War II, no states had nuclear weapons, but then quickly uh, about 90% of global military spending came to be associated with nuclear weapon states and their allies. So the cost of engaging in direct conflict became very, very high and quite suddenly so. And simultaneously, we have the rise of international organizations. There are a variety of ways to measure uh, international organizations. This is a narrow definition by PV Haas and colleagues, but regardless of which measure you use, the trend is rising. There are more international organizations and their importance in the international system has been rising. Now, within this context, we see many uh, assertions of dissatisfaction. So this is the G4 summit declaration in 2015. These are countries that want to be part of the UN Security Council, but are excluded. Uh, the quote is, the current composition of the UN Security Council does not reflect the changed global realities. The Council needs to reflect today's world in order to be able to tackle today's complex challenges. This is the BRICS Goa Declaration. We remain strongly committed to support the coordinated effort by emerging economies to ensure that the increased voice of the dynamic emerging and developing economies reflects their relative contributions to the world economy. We call for the advanced European economies to meet their commitment to cede two chairs on the executive board of the IMF. So in this case, it's the IMF that's the subject of contestation. Now, it's not just rising powers that engage in this kind of bargaining. Uh, we can go back to 1984 
with the United States expressing its dissatisfaction towards UNESCO, which was basically an argument about taxation without representation. And here's Jane Gerard saying, it should be understood that the UNESCO decision-making system can establish cumulative trends antithetical to the position of the geographic group that contributes to an overwhelmingly large part of the budget. And of course, more recently, uh, you have the previous United States president uh, arguing repeatedly that in some way the international order was unfair and rigged against the interests of the United States. So some of the puzzles that I seek to answer, why do some international institutions change while others stay the same? Uh, and I focus in particular on what I call distributional change, the propensity for decision-making shares and influence over outcomes to be redistributed among institutional members according to underlying shifts in interests and capabilities. So as powers rise, do they get more share of decision-making and influence or do they not? How closely do international institutions reflect underlying state preferences and power? And how will international institutions and the architecture evolve as dissatisfied states demand uh, changes increasingly? So I'll show you a few examples of what I mean. So this is a division uh, of IMF voting shares, essentially voting power in the IMF divided by world GDP share. Um, and it's the G7 countries separated into their status during World War II as allies or axis, which side of World War II did they fight on? And what we see is that even in 1960, 1998, 2004, um, the Allied powers were relatively overrepresented in terms of voting power in the IMF compared to countries that were on the losing side of World War II. So once institutions adopt certain power distributions, they can be quite sticky. They don't necessarily change to reflect underlying realities. But on the other hand, there are institutions like the European Union Council uh, where there isn't much of a penalty to new members. This is looking at voting power versus uh, population size. Uh, in the EU Council, new members pretty much get a fair share uh, based on population weighting. So it's not the case that new states are always underrepresented in every institution. On the other hand, we can look at similar kinds of institutions over time that behave quite differently. This is comparing the Council of the League of Nations to the United Nations Security Council and just the number of non-permanent members and the number of permanent members. And what you see on the left is that on the League of Nations Council, there was very uh, frequent change. The number of members changed, the number of permanent members increased and then decreased and so forth. But the United Nations Security Council has only been reformed once in its entire existence. It's a very stable institution. So my theory of renegotiation um, is that how flexibly institutions accommodate these kinds of demands for change by rising powers depend on policy area characteristics, and in particular network effects and barriers to entry in a specific issue area. In competitive policy areas where there's lots of institutions, um, it's easy to create alternative institutions to perform similar functions to existing institutions, and this means that dissatisfied states, rising powers, for example, have leverage to push for change. If the institution has flexible rules that can accommodate that kind of change, we'll tend to observe frequent renegotiation. On the other hand, if the institution is inflexible, it has a very high threshold for making decisions in the extreme unanimity rules, or there are many veto players, um, dissatisfied states may exit and create new institutions resulting in a new configuration that reflects the underlying power transition. I call this po policy area discipline, much like markets discipline firms. In monopolistic policy areas, on the other hand, it's more difficult to create alternative institutions. And this can limit the bargaining leverage of dissatisfied states and make the distribution associated with the status quo quite sticky and path dependent. And the way I think about this is contrasting uh, international institutions to firms in markets. Um, in markets, because uh, you have publicly traded shares, for example, uh, 
um, the attractiveness of firms tends to even out, right? So if Microsoft is very profitable and Walmart is not, the shares of Microsoft get bid up to the point where each uh, firm is roughly equally attractive. That's how efficient markets tend to operate. And so competition doesn't tend to have much of an effect on the ownership side. But on the production and pricing side, competition matters a lot. If there's competition, firms have an incentive to provide lower prices and better service because consumers have an outside option. For political institutions, I argue this is somewhat flipped. There's not much of a profit motive. So on the production pricing side, competition doesn't matter so much in the case of international institutions, but it matters quite a bit on the ownership side. Who uh, calls the shots? Who gets a seat on the executive board? What kind of voting power do they have? There, because there is no public market in the share ownership shares of international organizations, outside options matter. And the fact that there's competitors can give member states bargaining leverage and affect their ability to renegotiate institutions. And so this all leads to um, a set of predictions about uh, policy area effects and internal rules. Um, essentially, when outside options are attractive in competitive issue areas, depending on how difficult it is for countries to challenge the status quo within the institution, we'll tend to observe either exit from the institution or frequent renegotiation. On the other hand, if outside options are unattractive, um, we'll either see path dependence, not much change, or uh, renegotiations possible. But if costs of challenge are low, um, you might see renegotiation, but the outcomes won't necessarily correspond to relative power. They might reflect relative patience or some other factor. So um, in the book, what I essentially do is to test this set of theoretical predictions. And one major empirical challenge in studying international institutions is the simultaneous variation and non-random variation in a variety of important factors. So I focus on policy areas in my theory uh, and institutional rules to some extent, but institutions also vary in membership. It's a completely different set of countries involved in bargaining in one institution versus another. Uh, they exist in oftentimes non-overlapping or partially overlapping time periods. Things like the headquarter locations can vary, right? So the United States uh, hosts the United Nations and the Bretton Woods institutions and that can give the United States outsized influence, uh, but European states host a lot of institutions as well. And because of these challenges, existing work on institutions oftentimes relies on qualitative case studies or the studies of single institutions because it's just very hard to control for all these potential confounders. Um, so the solution that I propose in, in some of the chapters of the book is to look at the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, because for these sister institutions, we can control uh, for a lot of things. They're held constant, right? The membership composition, uh, there's very slight variation for some micro states, but essentially it's the same set of countries for the entire time period uh, of existence of these institutions. The internal rules governing redistribution are identical. The time period in which these institutions have existed are the same. They're both located right across the street from each other in Washington, DC. So all of these things are the same, but the institutions pursue cooperation in different policy areas. So we can isolate that effect of policy areas on the dependent variable that we're interested in, in terms of renegotiation outcomes. Um, so this, I argue, is similar to a, a crossover study. It's a kind of a quasi-experiment uh, in which separate treatments are applied to the same set of states operating under somewhat uh, different conditions, different issue areas, but under the same rules. So the policy areas of the World Bank, I'll, I'll go through this quickly because it's uh, more of details. Um, the IMF tends to be uh, in the business of managing financial crises and balance of payments problems. And I argue that for a variety of reasons, this issue area is subject to relatively strong network effects. You tend to benefit from having global surveillance because crises can move from one part of the world to another quite quickly. 
Um, there might be political sensitivities related to conditional lending. You don't want to be implicated in imposing conditions on other countries. So you want a universalistic institution that dilutes the blame uh, of imposing harsh policies. So for a variety of reasons, there's a strong incentive to try to cooperate through a single universalistic institution. But development aid, which is the issue area of the World Bank, is quite different. Aid can be easily provided uh, through a variety of means, multilateral, bilateral, large, small, public, private. Um, and if you have limited resources, you can pursue development aid through relatively small programs. So this issue area tends to be characterized by widespread competition of various forms. And I have some data in the book that supports this, that basically the IMF uh, across a variety of measures tends to dominate its issue area. It's not completely dominant. There are some peer institutions, uh, but for the most part, the IMF plays a very central role in financial crisis response and management compared to the World Bank, which uh, faces a wide variety of competition uh, from peer institutions as well as bilateral aid programs. And so the key prediction, of course, is that this means the IMF is relatively monopolistic, not completely, but relatively so. And it's therefore more difficult for dissatisfied states like Japan, like China, uh, to create alternatives and threaten to take their cooperation elsewhere, to threaten exit. And this means that change will tend to be limited despite the dissatisfaction of rising states. On the other hand, for the World Bank, because of this intense competition, there are many credible alternatives if states are unhappy with the status quo. And so in the World Bank, I predict that we should observe relatively flexible change. As rising powers rise, they should tend to get a larger share of voting power relatively quickly. Um, and I would point you to chapter three and four of the book for extensive quantitative and qualitative evidence. And I'll just show you sort of a, a bit of the kind of evidence that I provide. I, I know this is sort of a general audience without um, uh, some, some are not academics and so forth. Um, but this is a figure, just the raw data of the magnitude of voting share changes in the World Bank and IMF. And consistent with the predictions, we see that World Bank voting power is reallocated uh, to a larger degree and much more frequently uh, than the IMF. So this is the kind of evidence that I show that suggests that in fact, uh, the renegotiation context in the World Bank is quite different from that of the IMF. In the rest of the book, I provide a variety of evidence looking at uh, different international institutions. Uh, there's several case studies of Japan's renegotiation efforts uh, as it rose economically uh, in um, uh, the 19th century to present, uh, both in the economic institutions like the World Bank and IMF, but also in the UN Security Council. Uh, I look at this issue of policy area discipline in development, IGOs, and uh, integration projects. This is the idea that uh, in competitive policy areas, institutions that have rigid decision rules, like one country, one vote procedures or unanimity rules tend to decline in importance because that's not flexible enough. Dissatisfied states will simply take their business elsewhere. So UN development agencies has dec have declined in importance over time because they're situated in a competitive issue area, but they have very rigid structures that cannot accommodate underlying shifts. Um, and I'll, I'll skip the other stuff, um, but there's plenty more if, uh, if you're interested in the book. So then turning to some of the contemporary policy implications. Of course, there's this widespread discussion uh, in, in the policy world as well as in academia about, is the international order somehow under threat? Is the liberal international order in a crisis, um, partly because of rising powers, but also because of the retreat of traditional defenders like the United States and United Kingdom? And so I think my book and subsequent work um, provide some uh, suggestions about how to think about the contemporary international order. You know, most debates about the current world order tend to adopt a relatively static view. Um, a very common view is the US-led liberal international order. John Eikenberry, of course, is a, is a key proponent of this view. 
Um, and, the, and according to the static view, movements away from certain key features of the order are inherently threatening to the order. They seek to undermine it. So for example, if we see declining US hegemony, um, a retreat from free trade, or receding liberal democracy, since these characteristics are intertwined with the notion of liberal order, um, that suggests that the order might be under threat. But my book suggests an alternative formulation about how we might think of order. Uh, I argue that a key innovation of the contemporary world order is its openness to peaceful renegotiation. Countries can rise and exert influence without resorting to coercion or violence. Um, renegotiation through bargaining and the creation of new institutions of the kind that we discussed earlier is not a threat to the order according to this view. It's actually a fundamental and beneficial feature. Instead of taking up arms and fighting wars with each other, states can essentially create alternative institutions. In some sense, this is a good thing. It's not a threat to the order. And in fact, the order already reflects previous renegotiation efforts by a variety of states. Japan's creation of the ADB and a whole variety of other institutions that Japan spearheaded, including APEC. Um, Saudi Arabia and its creation of OPEC. OPEC was not favorable uh, for the United States and status quo powers, but it, it's an important part of the contemporary order. Uh, China's status as a P5 member in the UN Security Council is another example of renegotiation that occurred peacefully, uh, but gave an important rising power uh, a stakeholder status in a way that wouldn't have been possible under previous international orders where the uh, ability to fight wars and engage in violence was quite critical. That said, renegotiation has its limits. And this is suggested by the findings in my book. Um, I've worked on, uh, I'm working on a new paper with uh, Adam Liff in Indiana University, where we suggest that the world order has moved to uh, what we call an open access international order to a significant degree. Uh, under previous orders like imperialism, you had essentially a limited elite club, right? Membership in the elite club required demonstrating your military might uh, through the use or coercion, uh, the use of violence or coercion. But in the contemporary order, countries can gradually work their way up peacefully into positions of prestige and influence. Uh, and they don't have to engage in these kinds of violent confrontations. Um, and so that, I would argue, has been the path that Japan took after World War II, and to a significant degree is also the path that China is taking, um, although there might be some debate about that second one. Um, of course, there are still important rigidities because of issue areas with unattractive outside options. The UN Security Council is difficult to replicate. There aren't attractive outside options, and that limits the ability of dissatisfied states to renegotiate. The IMF, as we talked about, internet governance is another one where very strong network effects makes renegotiation quite difficult. So an important policy question for status quo states is, is it worth sustaining their advantageous position in these institutions, even if that means rising states will remain frustrated with the contemporary order, or is it worth conceding some ground? So I'll close with a little bit of a discussion of the rise of China. Of course, we've seen some discussion in the United States that sees the rise of China as potentially threatening, whether it's the military dimension or the economic dimension. And if you believe in things like power transition theories, it sure looks like China is about to uh, catch up economically to the United States. And the prediction traditionally has been uh, that that would lead to tensions and potentially conflict. Um, this is a figure I oftentimes show to my students, right? It's the world GDP share of the principal initial combatants of World War I and World War II compared to just the USA, Japan, and China today. It's basically about the same, right? So if the US, Japan, and China engage in military conflict, it would essentially be World War III. The impact economically would be no different. And, and this doesn't even account for the likelihood that other allies uh, would get involved as well. So the stakes are obviously very, very high. A common view 
in, in the United States at least about the rise of China uh, is that um, there's gonna be a high likelihood of tensions and conflict. Um, Graham Allison is, is a key proponent of this view. But my book suggests greater scope for potential optimism. Uh, China can and has, I would argue, enhance uh, its global leadership role peacefully by increasing its influence over international institutions. And this can take place either through bargaining or the creation of alternatives. Uh, as I discussed at the beginning of the presentation, resorting to the use of military force has become more costly and in many cases less necessary compared to historical time periods. And uh, through peaceful renegotiation, China has already attained privileged status in major international organizations. And this is primarily thanks to the credential switch with the representatives of Taiwan that took place in the 1970s and 1980s. China, uh, the Chinese government was able to uh, achieve privileged status in major UN organizations uh, in a way that countries like Japan have uh, still struggled to achieve. And so this makes China much more of a stakeholder in the existing international order than historical rising powers. Um, I've written on the AIIB as well. Uh, much of the commentary in the US and Japan uh, sees the AIIB as potentially threatening uh, and a competitor to the INF and World Bank. Um, and I think this contributed to skepticism and non-participation in the institution. Uh, however, there are a variety of problems with such a view. Uh, the AIB is not really a plausible competitor to the IMF. Uh, the institutions operate in completely different issue areas. Um, China has uh, created some currency swap arrangements. Uh, the BRICS contingent reserve arrangement is, is a notable one, but these remain largely linked to uh, the presence of an IMF program. And so don't look like clear attempts to overturn the status quo. The AIB fundamentally is a development institution. And as we saw already, that's an issue area where competition is already very widespread. So the fact that a new institution is introduced by China isn't a game changer, right? Uh, it might shift the status quo slightly, but um, it's, it's not the kind of major development that it's oftentimes made out to be. Uh, the institution, much like other development institutions, will face strong pressures to reflect the interests of all participants. Um, and otherwise it will tend to face exit and irrelevance like other development institutions that were inflexible. Okay, so to conclude, uh, my work considers international renegotiation and propose a new theory about institutional change and conducts causal inference, taking advantage of various features of international organizations. And I would argue that the book has many important policy implications, um, uh, as well as implications for academic debates about the international order on big questions like the likelihood of conflict among nations, how to think about the reform of the international organizational architecture, and how to respond to China's rise and its creation of new institutions. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I will put up a list of related work that you can take a look at if you're interested in this and related topics. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Lipsy, uh, for the thought-provoking and insightful sharing. Uh, I particularly like uh, your use of economic tools and concepts uh, to think about the evolution of uh, international organizations, as well as you know, how countries try to re renegotiate within organizations. If not, uh, then they would try to create new ones. Uh, but one thing that uh, I would like uh, you to uh, comment more about is, uh, if we look at sort of the dominant international organizations, uh, such as the World Bank and the IMF that you mentioned, they were created uh, mostly after the Second World War when uh, the allies uh, you know, were in dominant positions, both economically and politically. The more recent, uh, uh, crea recently created organizations, uh, such as uh, the Asia Development Bank uh, created uh, at least uh, proposed initially by the Japanese government, or as you mentioned, the AIIB, 
uh, proposed and uh, mostly influenced uh, by the Chinese government uh, were very different uh, from those uh, that were created by uh, the Western liberal uh, order countries. Um, so, you know, in some sense, you know, these organizations share a lot of common views and goals, um, you know, to provide uh, aid uh, for development projects, for example. But on the other hand, uh, the creators of these organizations probably have some different views about what the world order should look like, or even politically, you know, how uh, those organizations should be run. Uh, so could you comment a little bit about, you know, how these potentially differences in ideologies or agendas may undermine multilateralism or even create a more divided world? Absolutely. I, I think this is absolutely right. Um, so when countries create uh, alternatives to existing international organizations, um, they usually do so because they're unhappy about some feature of the status quo. Um, in the case of China, um, the purported reasons have been existing multilateral uh, uh, development banks are too slow and they have onerous conditions that have to be met, environmental conditions, human rights, for example. Um, and the demand for infrastructure in Asia in particular is vast. And so we need institutions that can deliver this more quickly. Um, and, and so I think these are reasonable arguments. Um, many would push back and say that's not the case and that these conditions are in fact important uh, for the sake of accountability. But the key is in a competitive issue area, uh, countries and institutions can essentially propose their solutions and see uh, what works. Uh, and so I think that is a major benefit in some sense of competition. Now, you know, uh, some people might say, well, a downside to this is that it can create a bit of a race to the bottom. That essentially, if uh, China uh, creates an institution that has limited standards, uh, then why would any countries turn to the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank that all the money will end up coming from uh, institutions that uh, are focused primarily on pushing money out the door and not on environmental sustainability and other important goals. Uh, but I would argue that that hasn't been the case, uh, that basically uh, some countries have preferred to uh, turn to incumbent institutions uh, because they might offer advantages. High, higher quality is something that Japan has been pushing in infrastructure projects, for example. And so I think this kind of competition can be quite healthy um, in uh, assessing the arguments of both incumbent states and rising powers. And so I take the position that it's not undermining the international order. In the extreme, I suppose that could be possible, but within uh, relatively competitive issue areas, um, I think it's it can be healthy competition. And I think that's, at least to my, uh, in my assessment, that's what we're observing uh, up until the current point. Great, thank you. Uh, let me ask another question, uh, which is related to uh, the book that you're working on, uh, particularly on international cooperation to fight um, climate risks or to do with uh, the risk coming from uh, the climate change. Uh, so in your presentation, uh, you uh, try not to mention that, I guess, you know, you want to hold our excitement and uh, we all look forward uh, to your new book. Uh, so how can we use your framework uh, in particular uh, about monopolistic policy areas and uh, sort of the network effect to think about the potential co cooperation in these particular issues, on this particular issue? Yeah, climate change, I think, is, is quite uh, a challenge. Um, and, you know, one, one of the key challenges, I would say, is that um, there, there isn't uh, a strong tendency towards monopolization. Uh, in fact, uh, if you can get the rest of the world to commit to uh, emissions reduction goals, and you can unilaterally defect, that's, that's wonderful. Right, uh, it, it's in fact the the best outcome possible, which is the opposite of network effects, uh, to some degree, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, that makes the kind of cooperation that needs to happen to solve climate change uh, 
uh, even more complicated in, in many respects. Um, but the, the key argument that I make in the new book is that many of the solutions to climate change will have to come from the domestic political side, that uh, a lot of attention has focused on international relations because of this global public goods nature of climate change. But that if you observe the behavior of states, sometimes states, even without global cooperation, are willing to make significant investments in addressing uh, climate change mitigation. And that tends to have to do with domestic preferences, domestic institutions uh, that um, sometimes are uh, uh, quite set in stone. They're difficult to change, uh, but uh, some change might be possible. And, and so that's uh, broadly speaking, the argument of the book that we might need to focus more so than we have in the past on domestic political solutions to climate change, uh, rather than trying to solve this issue through international cooperation. Both are important, but the domestic political side should not be neglected. Great. Um, since you started mentioning national preferences and you know, domestic politics, uh, you know, let me get to the first question uh, from the audience. Um, uh, and the question is very long, but you know, let me try to shorten it and summarize the key points. Um, you know, we know there has been a rise uh, in nationalism or populism uh, in many nations. Um, you know, strong and powerful leaders uh, probably will have uh, their own opinions about the new world order and therefore how the international organizations should be reformed to serve their own uh, national interests. Uh, could you comment a little bit about, you know, this new uh, development uh, in the geopolitical space, uh, you know, whether it is a threat or uh, it would actually lead to uh, you know, more competition, as you said, and therefore a better world eventually. Yeah, I think it's informative to look back at the 1980s. Um, what is happening in the recent period has some echoes of what happened then, uh, particularly under the Reagan administration. You had um, a government in the United States that was very skeptical towards multilateral solutions to international problems. Um, that was when the first US exit from UNESCO happened, for example, and lots of threats to withdraw funding from the United Nations as well. So one lesson we can draw from that time period is one, uh, the United States uh, tends to have somewhat volatile politics surrounding international organizations. So that period ended with re-engagement uh, so if you wait, things might uh, improve, as I think you've, you've seen to some degree from the transition uh, from Trump to the Biden administration. But the other lesson is that there can be some opportunity for reforms of existing institutions that are created by those expressions of dissatisfaction by the United States. And in fact, there were some major reforms of the UN system, of UNESCO, that took place after that very volatile period uh, that I think most would suggest have improved accountability and the functioning of these institutions. And so I've heard policymakers suggest that this might be a, another opportunity to reinvigorate international institutions. Um, and I think that's right, there is an opportunity and seizing it, I think is the policy uh, you know, where, where policymakers have faced their challenge. Um, you know, the opportunity is real, whether it can be seized uh, is something that I can uh, predict far less accurately. Great. Um, a second question, uh, let me just read it out. Um, you know, there's some historical context that you probably know better than me. Given the new constraints of mutual nuclear destruction and much greater interconnectivity, would a new concert of powers be achievable, representing the leading global powers of today, uh, such as the US, China, and the European Union, together with Russia, permitting both competition and rivalry within a framework for negotiation and moderation, similar to the concert of Europe in the 19th century? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think it is within the realm of possibility. Um, you know, the, the key issue that international institutions uh, have not resolved 
is security competition. Questions like uh, the status of Taiwan, right? There isn't an international organization that can solve that question for you. And it's not a question that you can solve easily, at least through peaceful renegotiation. Um, and so, you know, how the United States, China and other countries, stakeholders, uh, build institutions around those kinds of questions. Um, I do think that is critical. Whether the concert model uh, is possible uh, is going to depend a lot on whether China is interested in uh, adopting that kind of model. I think the United States might be willing uh, to consider uh, that kind of arrangement to some degree. Uh, but not if it results in ceding a lot of ground on uh, traditional U.S. security interests in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so I do think uh, some type of uh, arrangement along those lines could be feasible. I, I'm skeptical that an institution like the U.N. Security Council will be able to deal with these kinds of questions. So ultimately, you will need some type of um, either bilateral, multilateral arrangement. Of course, the worst outcome is outright hostility, right? A new Cold War. And so something that's not like that, that reflects a higher degree of cooperation and negotiation would be desirable uh, for all sides. But uh, that would probably require mutual suspicion to be mitigated from uh, you know, where they seem to be headed at the current time. Great. There's a question from your fan. Uh, he said uh, he's a big fan of your books and other research. Specifically, his question is, uh, on your main two by two table, will there be alternative views uh, about the outside options by different countries? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in, in the book, I argue that outside options uh, are no, right? So this is the, the assumption I make in modeling the interaction among states. But um, I think it would be quite interesting to consider uncertainty about outside options. You can imagine uh, the uncertainty being quite high, for example, in a case where a threat is made regarding the creation of a new institution, right? Which might be a bit of a project, right? Can the dissatisfied state attract new members to this institution? Will it be viable? Will financial support be available? So if there is pervasive uncertainty, then you can imagine a scenario where uh, there is disagreement about the attractiveness of outside options. And then you get into sort of classical uh, game theoretic uh, questions about uh, incentives to misrepresent uh, the attractiveness of outside options and those kinds of things. So I, I do think that's a really interesting question and a potentially interesting area for further thought. Yeah, great question, thank you. Okay, uh, all of a sudden there are a lot of new questions coming in, uh, but let me ask one first so that I have time to read other questions. Uh, what are the incentives uh, those hegemonic power, con powerful countries have to accept peaceful renegotiation? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, so. Ultimately, um, you know, militarized conflict is costly for everyone. And so if you have rising countries and, you know, ultimately they're going to, their dissatisfaction is going to rise to the point where they're likely to take up arms and fight with you, you might as well give up some concessions. And, you know, the question is really, um, you know, if, if you're selfish, the, uh, you know, the equilibrium point is you give up just enough so that they're unhappy, but uh, satisfied enough that they're not going to fight with you, right? So you can imagine this sort of renegotiation game continuing where uh, rising states are always kind of unhappy, but not so unhappy that they're going to engage in destructive behavior. Um, but that's the basic underlying logic, right? That uh, giving away something might prevent an even worse outcome. And that's true even within peaceful uh, outcomes, right? So you might uh, face a state that's threatening exit from your institution. You might give them just enough 
so that staying in the existing institution is more attractive than pursuing exit. Um, so, so that's the kind of thinking that goes into uh, the model, at least that I use in my book. Thank you. Nice. Uh, let me, there's still a few more, but give, in interest of time, let me pick maybe two or three. Um, okay, this one is nice. Um, so as we consider renegotiation of the new world order, could you please explain whether examining Bretton Woods institution is modern enough, I guess, you know, is sort of up to date. While it is true that the nuclear deterrence is compelling, isn't the digital world, you know, with internet and fintech or whatever, the new battlefield uh, that uh, will uh, require a new set of rules, uh, international organizations and whatnot? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Um, and so I think there are a lot of issue areas in, in cybersecurity is, is, is an important one. Space uh, is another one as well, where cooperation has really not been as developed as it should be, right? Election interference is another one that became quite timely uh, in a variety of ways, where you can imagine everybody would benefit if there was a robust institution that facilitates cooperation. Um, but this may very well be an area where uh, the world has become more complex. There are many more states uh, and stakeholders, and it's oftentimes difficult to create institutions when you have uh, almost 200 voices in the room, right? So in, in that sense, the moment after World War II was one that was amenable to this kind of grand institution building. And the new uh, status quo that we face today is one in which these new challenges uh, might be harder to resolve through institutionalization. I don't think it's impossible. And, we, and we've seen internet governance, for example, evolve despite uh, these difficulties, um, but it is a major challenge. There are these two areas where there should be more cooperation, but at least uh, up until now, there isn't. Great. There's a question about internet governance. Uh, I guess uh, you just touch on, uh, you know, but what kind of uh, international organiz organizations uh, can you envision to deal with such a sensitive and uh, to some extent um, intangible areas? Yeah, um, you know, they, they're, they're, the status quo is actually quite fascinating here. A a Abe Newman has, has some good work on this if you're interested, uh, as, as does Dan Dresner. Uh, at, uh, at Tufts, um, you know, but, but it tends to be uh, quite decentralized, right? So depending on which question about internet governance you're concerned with, there is a somewhat different architecture. And so, you know, how you conceptualize that, um, do these different pieces fit together or should we think of them as uh, distinct institutions, distinct mechanisms? Um, that's, that's sort of an interesting question that uh, scholars are dealing with. And some of the recent work um, on international institutions thinks about regime complexes. How do regimes interlock with each other and interact with each other? So this is actually really cutting edge stuff and it's an issue area, uh, I think, where these kinds of dynamics uh, are quite interesting and uh, exciting to research. So I don't have a good answer to your question, but uh, if you're interested, uh, there's a lot of literature that you can look at on this. Great. Let me ask a question uh, for my student uh, who learn about international trade in my class. Uh, so we know uh, the global supply chains have been restructured uh, since the beginning of the US-China trade war, which has been potentially accelerated by the pandemic. How would a more divided international trade system uh, affect uh, the future reforms or the potential new creations of international organizations. So, I mean, we, we know we are way past the stage of hyper globalization. And some people already mentioned we're in a stage of deglobalization. Uh, potentially in certain areas, we may see less connectivity uh, between countries, especially uh, between the, the US and some of its uh, uh, competitors. Uh, so could you speak a little bit about, you know, how this changing economic structure may affect the future international organizations? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, you know, so at the end of the day, 
um, if you don't have any interaction, uh, then you don't really have much incentive to cooperate or create international organizations. Um, but that's quite extreme, right? Um, you know, so we're, we're certainly seeing to some degree deglobalization taking place, but I think it's quite limited, which is to say, I don't think the extent of deglobalization that we're seeing uh, today is so large that it's going to affect the basic reality of the international system, which is pervasive interconnectedness, pervasive uh, mutual interest over key governance issues in the international system. Uh, you, you'd have to see deglobalization progress uh, on a much larger scale to a much larger degree uh, to diminish connections between states enough, right? We're not talking about the US and Soviet Union uh, when we talk about the United States and China today, right? There's, there's just no way, at least that I see, that the economic relations between the US and China would become separated to that degree. And, and if they do, it would be a disaster uh, on a whole uh, variety of levels. So um, I, I would say that at least up until now, I don't think this is a game changer, but you know, it, it, it could certainly affect cooperation in specific issue areas where connections become much weaker than they used to be. Great, uh, let me uh, close today's uh, session uh, by saying thank you very much uh, to Professor Lipsy because uh, it's already 10 p.m. Uh, over there in Toronto and it must be uh, quite late for your time. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I think I have already diverted most of the relevant questions to you and there's some compliments which I'm gonna share with you over email. Uh, we would like to have you uh, to come uh, again to give us uh, hopefully a physical face-to-face -face, uh, seminar. Uh, when I your new book to. comes out you. uh, about uh, climate change, but let me let me you know in the interest of time, but I all, I'm very curious uh, about uh, the potential collaboration collaboration between China and the U.S. Uh, on climate change issues. Uh, I fully agree with you that you know there are a lot of domestic initiatives and barriers about you know those collaboration, but it seems that this is uh, the most optimistic area over which the two superpowers may have some agreement on. Uh, do you see that as a good starting point for further collaboration in a, in a, in a very contentious world? Absolutely, I agree. Um, I, th I think collaboration between the two sides on this issue is uh, critical, um, uh, but uh, so might be some degree of competition. I mean, we, we saw this with vaccine development during the COVID pandemic that um, even though cooperation might not have been quite what it should have been, uh, the competitive dynamics, in fact, might have led to uh, national investment in the creation of vaccines. And some of that was duplicative, but maybe that was a good thing, given that we didn't really know which ones were going to work out well. And so I think with climate change, it could very well be similar, that if you can get some competitive dynamics, who is going to lead? on climate change, um, that that could also help. Um, and so, you know, if this becomes one of the key uh, points of contestation, uh, is the United States or China gonna lead the world towards solutions on climate change? I think that could also be a good outcome, but cooperation of course is also uh, good if it can uh, move forward. Great to learn about all this. Thank you so much, Professor Lipsy. Um, Thank you so much, it's my pleasure. So uh, the AGI team would like to pull out a slide uh, to promote ourselves uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, you know, today's uh, webinar uh, will be recorded and posted on our social media uh, later today. Uh, you know, we are on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, please follow us. Uh, Professor Lipsy, uh, good night, uh, and we will be in touch, and hopefully uh, we will get you back to talk about your new book. When will it Thank come you. out? I look forward to it. Uh, it we'll, we'll, we'll see. Academic presses are quite slow, so right. hopefully next year. Great. Bye for now. Bye-bye.